So thank you to both the uh, chairman for having me here today. It's ironic. Um, it's been 20 years since I've been in Seattle, and the last time I was here, uh, I visited Dr. Scribner on his houseboat. And if, for those of you who don't remember, Dr. Scribner was the father of vascular access for hemodialysis who developed the Scribner shunt. Um, I'm also here in the presence of my former fellowship program director and uh, colleague. So uh, I have no disclosures. Um, Iran wanted me to touch upon this transition from surgeon to interventionalist. And uh, it didn't occur so much as you know having patients run away from the waiting room, but my waiting room was obliterated. And um, I'll, I'll show you how I got there. So I briefly want to talk about ultrasound guidance as a en key enabling skill and some venous and ac arterial access basics and advanced stuff and how things have changed. So I'm what you'd call a, a classically trained vascular surgeon in a 5 plus 2 paradigm where I'd done a full general surgery residency and then two years of vascular surgery. And then I started my practice as a community vascular surgeon doing low to mid-level uh, uh, vascular surgery and only open vascular surgery. So there was no significant endovascular component to my first job. And then uh, our provincial health authority regionalized vascular surgical care around the greater Toronto area. And as part of that, my practice of low to mid-level acuity stuff was moved to a um, university teaching hospital, really one of our hospitals of last resort in the province. And um, with that, they put us on salary and gave us access to EVAR. And the salary component's important. Um, at that point, uh, peripheral vascular disease interventions for occlusive disease were being done by my VIR colleagues, and I suddenly went from my rather pedestrian practice to a large number of medically complex patients who were really unsuitable for open surgery. And my open surgical cases became those combined surgical oncology and vascular cases, iatrogenic trauma. We had a nice big pediatric trauma center across the street. Uh, and my PVD practice became amputations and foot debridements. So my, my satisfaction was declining rapidly. I knew something had to change, and at the same time, the paradigm of vascular surgical treatment had changed. And there's virtually, except for those areas I'd already outlined, virtually no area of vascular care that can't be treated endovascularly. So I was a recent graduate and out of date. So through some rather unique circumstances, um, Dr. Kachura accepted me as a fellow uh, as a, uh, to be trained fully as a, uh, uh, in both vascular and non-vascular interventions and the only Canadian vascular surgeon to have done a full interventional radiology fellowship. Uh, what was also unique was I did it in my own hospital. And I went from you know, having worked there for five years as a staff to being a trainee. And you know, there's a big importance to the credibility and proper training. Um, but at the same time, I, I, while I, I took a big pay cut that year, um, I was learning something new every day, nuances of cross-sectional imaging, radiation safety, image guidance. Uh, and to some extent, you, you need the personality to be able to take your surgical ego and put it aside and be the dumb guy in the room again. That's very important to be. Um, approaching these new experiences with uh, some humble attitude. But at the same time, you start to see some things through a surgical lens. And that you know, when doing vascular, non-vascular interventions, my background obviously made me more interested in one area, but I'd forgotten how much I enjoyed the biliary tree. And biliary and non-vascular interventions, just a different size of access and different door. In vascular interventions, we have a small door of entry. Non-vascular, bigger. Uh, and the same skills that I would use to biopsy an adrenal gland under CT guidance, I could use for access to embolize an endoleak. And one of the things that uh, John always taught me was it's about the pictures, but it's also about the feel. And surgeons understand this when their guide wires being, uh, having, uh, not advancing properly and your equipment's deforming and you understand the feeling of a needle that goes into the lumen of a vein or an artery and the guide wire advancing smoothly. Um, these are things that we, we learn and are happy about. So my early challenges were really learning good ultrasound guidance, which I found to be a, a key enabling skill integrating data from multiple imaging modalities simultaneously. And this is something that 
I think radiologists will and always do much better in, uh, until such time as we have really the advanced uh, integration that we, we saw Dr. Swanstrom talking about. And um, some responsibilities of working between two departments can be quite challenging for scheduling, managing call schedules for both groups. Uh, but at the same time comes with this a big advantage. You're doing a lot of procedures that would not normally be part of vascular surgical practice. Uh, things from portal vein embolization and uh, portal vein access for pancreatic islet cell transplantation, um, renal denervation when that was fashionable, uh, biliary uh, stenting and drainage. Um, so these are things that I, I kind of get me back to my general surgical roots in some way and bring me into contact on a daily basis with a much broader group of practitioners and really improve my personal and professional satisfaction. But in terms of starter cases, PICK lines. A PICK line has some micropuncture access, Seldinger technique, some basic ultrasound and fluoros fluoroscopy guidance, central venous access cases. Um, I don't do ablations um, anymore, but uh, a lot of uh, the ablations that I did as a trainee were excellent training for ultrasound guided um, uh, solid organ access and straightforward iliac intervention. These are all good places to start. Now, as surgeons, you'd never hand a resident a scalpel and let them move it in the ab patient's abdomen blindfolded without seeing what they're doing. So with respect to ultrasound and an in-plane access where the beam is only a millimeter wide, take some time to learn to line everything's up, everything up between two hands and see the full passage of the needle. And this is you know, my preference. Um, so I, I can see where it's going. I'm putting a sharp object in a patient. I need to know where, what I'm doing. Sometimes, though, you have to give up the position of the needle uh, to a more favorable location, and your ultrasound probe will go to a different, different location. Uh, and I'll do an out-of-plane access um, for more um, temporary access. Um, central venous catheters, I tend to prefer the internal jugular vein, which is bigger, straighter, a uh, shorter path to the uh, superior vena cava, um, avoids the complications of thrombosis and stenosis uh, and loss of arm uh, upper extremity access with subclavians. Uh, and I, as noted, I use ultrasound guidance. Uh, I prefer free-handed uh, guidance rather than a, a needle guide and prefer in-plane with a low puncture. And we know as surgeons, you need to set yourself up for success. Ergonomically, you need to set up the room so that you're not turning your head to strain to see the ultrasound screen. You have to have your equipment ready to go uh, and be able to grasp it with one hand while you're maintaining your image. Um, here's the internal jugular vein uh, in front of the carotid. And I'll use a 25 gauge needle that I infiltrate local with just to set myself up proprioceptively and uh, understand the relationship of my hands to this patient's target and the ultrasound probe before I go on with the uh, punc uh, with full puncture needle. Uh, people ask me, how do you know for sure you're on the right, uh, in the veins and on the right side? Well, if you're not sure, you can pass your guide wire all the way from the SVC to the IVC, and that's a pretty safe and uh, uh, sure thing. I'll measure fluoroscopically the length of my catheters. Here's a portacath, and I'm estimating the uh, uh, length of the portacath that I'm going to be placing. Um, here's a Hickman catheter that looks okay. It's not, it's not too short. Uh, but it's not too long either on a really big patient and they come back later um, after they've stood up and their catheter's not working. So you do have to pay attention to um, these sorts of complications and avoid them in the same way uh, an ounce of prevention avoids a second revisional procedure. In terms of arterial access, uh, we want to hit the common femoral artery which overlies the medial third of the uh, femoral head for hemostasis. And sometimes we see the cardiologists um, breaking this rule, and uh, here's someone who had a rather low puncture and a false aneurysm. Uh, ultrasound guidance goes a long way to trying to avoid this. I'll use micropuncture access with a 21-gauge needle in anticoagulated patients. If I've used a standard 19-gauge needle that I and have missed several times uh, for an antigrade femoral access and tibiopedal access, or if I'm just doing a diagnostic study and don't want to put a large, uh, large cannula in. Here, just the uh, standard needles, the Seldinger 19-gauge needle on the bottom, uh, an acoustic system with a 22-gauge needle for solid organ access, and the micropuncture kit. Um, 
as a vascular surgeon, I'm doing a lot of PVD work, and a lot of this involves infrainguinal, infrainguinal disease in the femoral popliteal and tibial segment. So an anti-grade access, um, which is what we like to do at UHN, uh, will shorten my distance to the target lesion, give me a big mechanical advantage. Ergonomically, it's easier, but uh, I have colleagues around the city who prefer an up and over approach, which unfortunately doesn't work if the patient has an EVAR in place, or a kissing stance, or is a really tall guy requiring a really distal intervention. Still for anti-grade femoral access, um, very obese patients and disease in the common femoral artery and a target lesion at the SFA origin or a flush SFA occlusion may preclude this or may mean that I'm doing a hybrid procedure with an open uh, cut down on the femoral artery and femoral repair along with uh, a percutaneous component. If you have a really big patient having a friend to hold back the panis or tape it up for an anti-grade femoral approach, here you can see the femoral head and the common femoral artery in front of this. The access needle hits the uh, common femoral artery just above the femoral head. Uh, what doesn't project as nicely here, but you can see the guide wire going into the profunda femoris artery. And if you have good ultrasound skills and have put a little curve on the end of your wire, you can redirect the uh, wire into the SFA and save yourself a lot of trouble putting in a sheath and a safety wire and using a directional catheter to try and get back into the SFA. As your skill grows, you can use ultrasound guidance for tibiopedal interventions uh, where you failed to cross a lesion from above. Um, posterior tibial and dorsalis pedis access will allow for a, a through and through wire after you've snared it. And then a, you can put a lot of tension on the wire and push your equipment through. It's become more and more popular for, to uh, place radial accesses. The cardiologists knew this about a, for a long time. And um, as our patients look more like your bariatric surgical patients who are prone to uh, femoral access complications, this is a very attractive alternative. Uh, it's attractive for patients who have scarred groins. It's attractive for those patients who are prone to bleeding or where the treatment angle of the target vessel may be much more readily accessed from above than from below. At the same time, you have to take into account you're going to be using longer equipment, uh, and uh, that sometimes means you'll have to go, um, and, and even industry has now recognized this in providing us with uh, longer equipment than previously. Hemostasis is simple with a radial artery compression device, and the patient is ready to go after uh, just a short period of time instead of a usual obligatory three or four hours of uh, bed rest after femoral compression. Here's a patient undergoing fibroid embolization from a transradial access, an SMA angioplasty and stenting. Here's a patient you can see who has a large renal uh, cell carcinoma who's going to be embolized immediately preoperatively. And just the way the renal artery is lying on the left side is just so much easier to come from the top, put in an occlusion balloon, and then uh, instill alcohol to ablate it. In my aneurysm practice, uh, now approximately 80% of my aneurysm cases are uh, done per totally percutaneously. Uh, I used to only do this under really thin patients, but now um, the patients who benefit the most are the obese ones. Uh, and patients have uh, reduced uh, pain, reduced uh, uh, bruising, and they're up and about faster than with an open cut down. Uh, and we're now into the era of, for select patients, uh, same day aneurysm surgery. So uh, we'll do this with a ProGlide device, which is one of the closure devices that still allows uh, wire access to the femoral artery. And you can see just rather than that whole line, just the one arrow, that's, that's their patient's access. And it's amazing when you see them in follow-up. So just I want to show you one case that I think highlights this kind of paradigm shift where uh, I received a patient on the transplant renal service who was 36, year old, uh, 36 years old, had gone to India for a kidney transplant. They gave him a bone marrow transplant at the same time for some purported immunologic benefit. Uh, he became very unwell, uh, developed acute renal failure. They put in a dialysis catheter on the right side and put him on a plane and told him, go back to Toronto, and when you get off from the airport, go to the Toronto General. So he arrives and uh, is admitted. Uh, he's septic, he's neutropenic with a, a white cell count of 0.1, and uh, the, they remove the temporary line because they don't know how long it's been in, and a few hours later, he develops hoarseness. Then he's seen by the ENT service who confirms with uh, a nasopharyngoscopy that his right um, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured 
or compressed. And here's what we were worried about. He's got a subclavian artery false aneurysm. So the surgeon in me was imagining this. In a guy who is neutropenic, septic, he's just had two of his systems transplanted. Uh, he won't survive this type of um, uh, sternotomy and supraclavicular kind of trapdoor exposure. So instead, transradial access uh, from the ipsilateral side, do an angiogram to identify the location of the vertebral artery and the false aneurysm you can see becoming opacified. Put a balloon across the origin of the aneurysm and inflate it for a couple minutes. Make sure he tolerates the fact that you know, his vertebral artery will be temporarily compressed. Use an ultrasound while you're waiting to puncture the false aneurysm through a supraclavicular window with a 21 gauge needle and inject some contrast. See that you're in and then inject thrombin and wait. Do another angiogram and you can see it's completely excluded and an ultrasound with the needle still in. You can see also there's no more any flow. You've saved this patient a horrible exposure. This is what the best of surgery and all of these paradigm shifts are about. So surgery has changed. Uh, now you've had a second person kind of talking about this. And really, in my mind, the importance of ultrasound for surgeons is a key enabling skill, ultrasound guidance. And early success with basic cases allows you to really think about more complicated interventions. So thank you for the opportunity today.